Tonight, UK Magistrate Court accepts evidence that the kidney donor in the case of former Deputy Senate President Ike Kuramadu and his wife, Beatrice, is not a minor. Adjourns trial till August the 4th. The President of the Senate deplores poor condition and management of Kujay Correctional Center in Abuja as he leads principal officers to assess the facility following Tuesday's deadly attack by terrorists. Federal High Court Abuja disqualifies Delta PDP governorship candidate Sheriff Oborewari for submitting false and forged documents to INEC. On business news tonight, African Development Bank President Akiwumi Adeshino says the continent needs $424 billion this year to fully recover from the devastation caused by COVID. On sports news tonight, Ons Jabeur becomes the first African woman in the open era to reach a Grand Slam singles final, defeating close friend Tatiana Maria in the Wimbledon semi-finals. And from Abuja, participants recommend review of the MBC Act 1992 as the House of Representatives Committee on Information holds public hearing on a bill to legalize the society of Nigerian broadcasters. And in international news from London, the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has quit as Conservative Party leader but says he will stay on as Prime Minister until the party has chosen his successor. It's their third court appearance in as many weeks. Nigeria's former Deputy Senate President Ike Kuramadu and his wife Beatrice continue their legal battle in the United Kingdom over organ harvesting charges. And today, some reprieve, it will seem, came their way as a Westminster Magistrate Court accepted that the said organ donor is not a minor. This was after the prosecution in the case said they have confirmed that the complainant is 21 years old and not 15, as earlier stated. A London correspondent, Juliana Olaika, who was at the courts today, reports that this new evidence came to light when both defendants appeared before Deputy Magistrate Tan Ikram, where they pleaded not guilty to all charges. Well, given the huge public interest around this case involving the former Deputy Senate President Ike Ekwiramadu and his wife Beatrice, there were no surprises that Westminster Magistrates Court uh, was absolutely full, full of uh, individuals that had specifically flown in from Nigeria to show the senator some support. And of course, uh, there are Nigerians within the British community uh, that have a keen interest in the trial too. Uh, two big um, outcomes from today's hearing. Uh, just uh, when the magistrate uh, was to dismiss the court, uh, the defense lawyers representing the Aquarimadus uh, produced this piece of evidence uh, that had been accepted by the prosecution, which is that this individual is is not a minor. It appears as if the information that had been gathered uh, by the senator's uh, defence team in Nigeria had reached uh, London in time for this hearing uh, today and it was accepted. But that doesn't mean uh, that this case isn't indeed serious. Um, due to uh, the huge public interest, uh, the magistrate did ask the prosecution to go through the details. Um, I won't go through them now because of course many of us will be aware of them, but this does involve organ harvesting and modern slavery and now the case was adjourned until the 4th of August and um, this will now be heard at the Central Criminal uh, Court and both defendants were remanded into custody. I think one of the sticking issues uh, from last week's appearance at Uxbridge Magistrates Court was jurisdiction uh, but that was cleared up pretty quickly um, according to the prosecution um, uh, the attorney general did not have to consent um, to whether or not this case could proceed in London and it appears as if that is the case uh, so just to confirm uh, the former deputy senate president Ike Ekwerimadu and his wife Beatrice have today in London been remanded into custody yet again and they are due to appear in front of a judge at uh, the Central Criminal Court on the 4th of August. Juliana Olayinka, reporting for Channels TV News in London.
In the meantime, reactions continue to trail the former deputy Senate president's case in the UK, and the latest is coming from a legal practitioner and member of Lincoln's in London, Daniel Boala, who has been given expert insight into the issue. He spoke to us from London. So, well, uh, the, the situation surrounding the case of Ekoremadu in England it's one that uh, involves two jurisdictions, but fundamentally, the jurisdiction of England and Wales, since the donation or the transplant was expected to have been conducted, uh, the procedure was expected to have been conducted in the United Kingdom. But the facts that are conflicting as of today is that, number one, the earlier uh, postulation by the boy that he was, an, he was uh, a minor was determined today. And it was determined on the basis of two things. Number one, the discovery. You recall that last week in Nigeria, there was an order from a court mandating NEMC and the immigration to produce the certified true copy of the guy's uh, bio data. That was used, and the court arrived based on the admission of the boy that he's above the age of 18. Having, reached the, having gone beyond the age of 18, facts that are to be determined by the court now will be whether... He has consented to because principally the laws in england that deals with this situation are the modern slavery act a modern slavery act deals with looking at uh, modern slavery and trafficking offenses so they want to determine number one if he is of age whether he was taken to the uk without his consent and then uh, so by his admission i'm sure the issue of minor has been dealt with the second issue which i believe may be the reason why Ekuremadu may not have been granted bail is that they will have to determine whether the agreement for him to donate his kidney was a transaction for pecuniary benefit. Because even in Nigeria, you are prohibited by law from selling any of your organ, both the seller and the buyer. But there is a law in England also that is the deemed law. More, uh, organ, I think organ something you are deemed to have do, given the consent that your organ be donated after you have died. But when you are alive, then the issue of consent is very fundamental. The other issue that is of concern people have asked is the boy haven't admitted that he is not a minor. What happens to him? There are two things. As of today, the boy is in the custody of the relevant agencies of government in the UK under the asylum principle. So if it is determined at the end of the day that he lied actually, then that would depend on whether that lie was an oath. If it is not a lie on oath or lie under oath, then I'm sure that what he may uh, be entitled to will probably be to de uh, deport him back to Nigeria without more. But if he lied under oath, then of course the law governing uh, perjury or so will have to apply. Well, back home and away from the courts, the Senate has criticized the management of Kujre Medium Security Custodial Center over the attack on the facility, which has now been claimed by the Islamic State for West Africa province, ISWAP. Speaking in Abuja after an assessment tour of the facility, the president of the Senate, Ahmed Lawan, in company of other principal officers, said they are disappointed that the area and indeed the facility has no CCTV. He believes the lack of surveillance incapacitated the management and security agencies from preventing and responding appropriately to the attack that led to the escape of over 800 inmates. The Kujie Custodial Center remains a beehive of activities as senators led by the president of the Senate pay a visit to the center. The senators are here on an assessment tour following an attack on the facility by Boko Haram terrorists who freed 64 of their members in detention. The Comptroller General of the Nigerian Correctional Service immediately briefs the entourage. After the tour, the Senate President expresses concerns over how 300 ISWAP operatives assessed the premises of a correctional center on foot, forced their way into the various cells, and operated for over one hour with a minimal casualty of four persons. Having gone around the facility itself, uh, we are disappointed that this uh, facility does not have CCTV 
uh, something that will record or at least give you uh, a view of what is happening uh, and sometimes record the events. Now, this is a medium security uh, custodial center. Uh, how on earth in the FCT facility of this magnitude we don't have even CCTV? Owing to the narrative of the Comptroller General of a Nigerian Correctional Service, the Senate President insists that the way the operation was executed strongly indicates insider's connivance, which must be critically investigated. Going from one cell to another to release people, specifically those that are known to be insurgents, tells a lot of story. It may not be far away from either an insider job. Uh, I, I, I think we have to look deeper into what happened so that we, uh, we find culprits because when things like this happen, there, there should be sanctions. As the Senate leadership expresses displeasure over the non-functional CCTV at the Kuji prisons, there are questions on the efficiency of the Senate and House of Representatives committees on interior on their oversight functions on the administration of custodial centers in the country. For the Chairman's Senate Committee on the Army, Alun Dume, insufficient manpower and security surveillance to secure the nation's population is to blame for the security breach at the Kuje Custodial Center. Senator Ndume was a guest on our program, Politics Today. Right now the insurgents are breaking in here, killing people every now and then. And then you're talking about bringing in some people and telling them, oh, yeah, go and see no more without proper investigation. And some of them, there are some people in detention that are innocent, likely, but not, maybe very few. But, so justice should be done accordingly, uh, not haphazardly. Uh, but anyway, the sum of it all is that we are not doing much or we are not concentrating or we are not prioritizing the key issue of security in this government properly. I mean, Nigeria with 200 million people, you have, I've been saying this several times, you have less than 400,000 police, you have less than 200,000 police, and you have all the security agencies put together uh, that their number is now up to 1 million. Go and check it. What we need to do, number one, is to get enough security agents on ground or personnel on ground in institutions like this or even uh, areas of public interest. If there were enough soldiers, enough uh, or, or well-equipped, well-trained personnel at that facility, those ragtag boys that came in, even they are not that professionally trained. Maybe, maybe they have one, but I'm sure they are not as trained as the Nigerian police, the Nigerian army. How come they come there is because they don't have, that place is not fortified enough. Those places don't have what they need technically, like uh, cameras, like drones, and like all things that they can use in order to, to, what, to address this matter. We'll stay with security. An early morning attack by gunmen in the commercial city of Mubi in Adamawa State has led to the death of at least two persons. According to sources, the gunmen stormed the residence of Reverend Daniel Amaru of EYN Church in Mubi at about 2 a.m., killing two of his sons and abducting his 13-year-old daughter while the cleric was shot in the leg. Although the police is yet to comment on the incident, the wife of the pastor was said to have passed out and rushed to the hospital alongside her husband for medical attention. Meanwhile, the governor of Adamawa State, Omar Fintiri, in a statement described the attack as shocking and barbaric and assures the family that the perpetrators of the act will be brought to justice. In part two, after the break, former aide to ex-president Goodluck Jonathan, Dr. Doyo Kupe, withdraws as a vice presidential candidate of the Labour Party. That's in a moment. Stay with us. Back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10, live on channels, television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Former Deputy Senate President Ike Kuramadu and his wife Beatrice remanded in custody till August the 4th as UK Magistrate Court accepts evidence that the kidney donor in their case is 21 years old. 
President of the Senate deplores poor management of the Kujay Correctional Center in Abuja as he leads principal officers to assess the facility following Tuesday's deadly attack by terrorists. Federal High Court Abuja disqualifies Delta PDP governorship candidate Sheriff Oborowori for submitting false and forged documents to INEC. And the former Director General of the Nigeria Television Authority, Professor Tony Radia, recommends a review of the NBC Act 1992 as the House of Representatives Committee on Information holds public hearing on a bill to legalize the Society of Nigerian Broadcasters. Reverend Father Philemon Obo of St. Joseph Retreat Center, Oboa, and Reverend Father Peter Odo of St. Patrick Oromi in Edo State have been reunited with their families and parishioners after they regained their freedom from abductors. The priests were kidnapped on July the 2nd while returning to Oromi in Edo State. After regaining freedom, they met with the acting governor of Edo State, Mr. Philip Shaibu, at the state government house in Benin City, the capital. Meanwhile, a funeral procession has held for Reverend Father Christopher Odia Ogedigbe, who was killed by gunmen after being kidnapped on June the 26th in Edo State. His colleagues and others bearing placards with different inscriptions who marched along Poly Road in Auchi, Edo State, are calling for an end to killings of innocent Nigerians in the country. The 41-year-old Reverend Father was the administrator of St. Michael Catholic Church and also the principal of St. Philip Catholic Secondary School, Chateau. And back to the courts where Justice Taiwo Taiwo of the Abuja Division of the Federal High Court has disqualified Sheriff Oborowori, the candidate of the Delta State People's Democratic Party for the 2023 governorship election. Delivering judgments, Justice Taiwo agreed with the plaintiff that Oborowori ought not uh, to be uh, the 2023 governorship uh, candidate for the PDP on account of allegedly supplying false and forged documents to INEC in aid of his qualification for the election. The judge subsequently directed INEC and the PDP to recognize the plaintiff who came second at the governorship primary as a candidate of the PDP in the election. Ms. Oborebori, who is the Speaker of the Delta State House of Assembly, had emerged a candidate of the party in the May 25th primary election. However, Olorogun David uh, Edewe, a former Commissioner of Finance under former Governor James Bori, had contended Oborebori's participation in the primary on the grounds of alleged discrepancies in his academic qualifications as well as his age. It specifically urged the court to bar the PDP from submitting Oborowori's name as the flag bearer of the party. Well, Mark Wilgo Yusuf is here from our Abuja studio for more on the news at 10. Hello, Mark Wilgo. Hello, Coyote. Our first story here begins right here in the broadcast industry. As experts say, there is a need for the Nigerian Broadcasting Commission Act of 1992 to be reviewed to catch up with modern reality. Uh, during a one-day House public hearing on a bill to provide for the regulation and conduct of the practice of broadcasting in Nigeria, a former Director General of the Nigeria Television Authority, Professor Tony Iridia, proposed the review. Participants at the hearing largely supported the bill, describing it as complementary to the National Broadcasting Act, although the NBC disagreed with the bill, saying it conflicts with the NBC Act of 1992. Our correspondent Terry Kumi reports. The House deliberated on two... Here in room 034 of the House of Representatives is filled to capacity with broadcasters and media professionals, all before members of the House Committee on Information. The purpose of the hearing is to seek stakeholders' input on a bill which seeks to give legal backing to the Society of Nigerian Broadcasters, which was inaugurated in 2021. The presentations kick off with participants highlighting the importance of the bill, while emphasizing that it does not conflict with the National Broadcasting Commission Act. Society of Nigerian Broadcasters is not to regulate the broadcasting sector. It's basically a meeting point for the practitioners meeting point to discuss the profession, meeting point to view and review the current trends in broadcasting, 
through annual conferences and forums and trainings as it is the practice in other professions. However, for the National Broadcasting Commission, the bill is not relevant. There cannot be two regulatory bodies governing or regulating uh, one uh, profession. The bill did not define broadcasting practitioner. NBC should define who a broadcaster should be, not any other body. Former Director General of the National Television Authority and Channels Television strongly disagree with the NBC, hinging their arguments on the need for proper management of information and accountability of the media in line with current realities. We are talking about looking for the ideal of regulation. What is the ideal? The ideal by international standard is self-regulation. All that NBC has said this morning is quite good. The only difference is that they are probably not aware that when events overtake the past, you look at ways of updating the old system. There is nothing wrong in amending the NBC Act. There is nothing wrong with it. In fact, it is better to do so. Broadcasters are made to go through a cadre of civil service or some kind of contract that does not really make sense to the extent that the fame that they have, the skills that they have, does not earn them even the income that they deserve as talented people. As lawmakers reconcile the submissions made, the Society of Nigerian Broadcasters believes that with the proliferation of broadcast outfits across the country, it is important to set a minimum qualification and ethical standard for broadcasters, broadcast journalists, or broadcast practitioners, not only to uphold the broadcast standard, but also for the good of the country. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. Into mainstream politics, the running mate to the Labour Party's presidential candidate, Dr. Donyo Kukwe, has withdrawn from the race, paving the way for a replacement which he says will be announced by the national chairman of the party soon. In a tweet on his handle, the former presidential aide said his withdrawal letter was sent to the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, this afternoon, and he feels greatly blessed to have been part of the foundation of the party's success. Dr. Okukwe had always maintained that his name was submitted to INEC only as a placeholder to give the party and the candidate, Mr. Peter Obi, more time to consult widely for a substantive vice presidential candidate. Well, while candidates perfect their tickets for the polls, no fewer than 20 million permanent voter cards are yet to be collected across the country. This is according to the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, who is worried about what this trend portends for the nation as it heads towards the 2023 general elections. Our political correspondent, Benga Ashiru, takes a look at the implications of this trend as the nation prepares for another political transition. Like a force that invades human life, it's the political season again. With the Independent National Electoral Commission having the 2003 calendar clearly outlined, many Nigerians now watch in keen anticipation of what beholds of the current transition. However, the earnest wait for a leader of our choice may end up in an avalanche of a mere wishful thinking with millions of permanent voter cards yet uncollected. There's just lack of information out there in the public. A lot of people don't know that their PVCs are ready. So it speaks to how is INEC communicating to the public, how are even the public, you know, receiving this information. No doubt this raises many unanswered questions for the Independent National Electoral Commission. Perhaps is INEC up on its feet in ensuring the voters get registered and their PVCs collected? We are calling on those who registered uh, before the 2019 general election uh, to turn up in our local government offices and collect their PVCs because we have um, a backlog of PVCs that have not been uh, collected. The reality of a wide yawning gap between the accredited voters and the registered voters no doubt leaves much to be desired in having a fair representative democracy. Voter party 
yes, if you look at the total number of voters, at the percentage of voters, you will be able to come to that conclusion. But many people had registered not with an intention to vote. Another salient question is how informed are Nigerians on the importance of having their PVCs collected? This takes us to the office of the National Orientation Agency, where we met with the Director General, Mr. Garba Abari. The NOA actually has been doing a lot of uh, sensitization activities. Ensure credible elections. I think it is state recorded Ensure about credible elections. Turnout, Do the right thing. Which is Collect your an appreciable PVC. difference Collect your PVC. from previous polls. And they use this the next governorship PVC election to is elect come July credible 16th. leaders which this country How sensitized more than any are other the eligible voters. Needs. The last election in the Kitty State recorded 30% voter turnout, which is seen as an appreciable difference from previous polls. The next governorship election is in Oshun State, come July 16. How sensitized are the eligible voters? I intend to vote because it's my civic right and my responsibility to choose whoever I want to. I hope that my, the person I'm going to vote for will win. I knew that he would make a lot of changes in the state. As the voting day for the 2023 general election beckons, how do we change the narrative that election season isn't just a jamboree, but a serious exercise that would inadvertently take us into the next political future? So why not grab your PVC and join in the shaping of the nation we want for ourselves, our children, and generations yet unborn? Binga Ashiru, reporting for Channel's Television News. I well, we do apologize for the audio glitch on that particular report. In other news, a group known as the League of Women Voters in Nigeria have frowned at what they describe as the insensitivity of government in the face of myriads of challenges, including insecurity, as to strike, among others, and have asked the President, Mohamed Buhari, to resign. In a statement by its president, Dr. Esther Uduehi, the group says they are unhappy with the gradual and total collapse of almost every fabric of governance in Nigeria, while the leadership stands aloof. The statement reads in part, It is even more alarming that in the midst of all of this, our president finds fun in globetrot. The statement further says, We therefore call on President Buhari and his government to resign and return our nation to us instead of swearing in new ministers. The League of Women Voters say their call is guided by the principle of reality and the need to keep Nigerians in one piece before the elections. Still ahead on the news at 10, the African Development Bank President, Mr. Kimu Miyadishino, says the continent needs $424 billion this year to fully recover from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. That's on Business News. Do join us again. A special offences court sitting in the Keja area of Lagos has convicted and sentenced to seven years in prison a fake army general. Bolarinwa Uluwashengwa Biodun, whose real name is Hassan Karim Ayinde. Justice Uluwatoni Tai was convicted and sentenced the convict without any option of fine. He was convicted following a plea bargain at the proceedings where he admitted to using the name of former President Olushegun Obasanjo to defraud a businessman, Mr. Bamidele Olushegun Safariu, to the tune of 270 million naira. In her judgment, Justice Taiwo ordered the convict to give 20 million naira to the complainant. He is also to forfeit four vehicles recovered during a search on his home at 1A. Joke Ayo Street, Alagbado, Lagos, amongst other property to be forfeited. Justice Taiwo said that the action of the convict shows the length scammers can go to defraud innocent victims, adding that such individuals should not be allowed to walk scot-free. More stories now. The National Commission for Refugees, Migrants and Internally Displaced Persons is to begin the construction of five resettlement cities for use by displaced persons in the country. The Commission also pegged official figures of refugees at 3.2 million, with over 84,000 so far registered in the country. 
This was disclosed by the Federal Commissioner of the Commission, Mr. Iman Soleimani Ibrahim, during a weekly ministerial briefing at the State House today. When displacements happen, flood, communal clashes, people lose their homes, not just their livelihood. So we, we started the piloting phase of the project Resettlement City in 2020. We're now in the third phase of this, this, um, pro uh, this project. The project Resettlement City would entail building, you know, rebuilding small communities because POCs have three options of durable solution. They can either locally integrate or they can resettle or they can go back to their homes, but sometimes they are unable to go back to their homes, and that's why there's need for, you know, building new communities or, or strengthening the capacity of their host communities. So, like I said, we started, we're in the third, we're in the third phase of our resettlement city project. We have um, the pilot, the, the pilot phase is in Borno State, Kano, Kasina, Zamfara, and Nasarawa, and then. A do state. Most of them are between 70 to 90 percent level of completion, but the Edo state one is about to take off. The foundation for the construction of the Adolo Koteabo Foundation building has been laid in Wari Delta State. The Joseph Adolo Koteabo Peace and Conflict Resolution Foundation was established in memory of the businessman and politician who lived his life promoting peace among people of different tribes and ethnic nationalities. Managers of the foundation expect that through well-structured and consolidated efforts, the foundation will ensure lasting and enduring peace in the society. It's the foundation laying ceremony for the construction of the Joseph Adolo Kotie Ebo Peace and Conflict Resolution Foundation in Wari Delta State. The exercise is part of activities to highlight the third memorial anniversary of Chief Adolo Kotie Ebo, who died in 2019. That he was a detribalized human being, somebody that relates with people from all walks of life, all tribes. He related, he brought people together, he reconciled tribes, ethnic ethnicities together. He brought people of that had differences in belief together. Yeah, he understand uh, the compassion of people, you know, and uh, and he, he lives, you know, as straight off, you know, as. A, a, a person that you know wants inclusion for all. The event also features songs and special prayers for the repose of his soul while his family and friends lay wreaths on his grave. resolution in your memory and so in the name of the father the project is unveiled and the foundation name is performed by the chairman signaling the commencement of the building construction wherever there is a dispute he always believe uh, in the peaceful resolution of such uh, disagreements that is the whole essence and I think uh, you can't find any greater honor uh, to be done in his memory than the establishment of this uh, uh, Peace and Conflict Resolution Foundation. It's a beautiful uh, board uh, led by Sanu Yetibo, who has known him. Every member of the board, and some are his siblings, some have known him. And this will be what to be quit when the Lord says that your work will speak after you. Born on February the 22nd, 1955, to the family of Chief Festus Okotiebo, Nigeria's first post independence finance minister in Obori community, Wari Delta State, Joseph Adolo Okotiebo trained as a pilot in the United States of America, but later went into private business on returning to Nigeria. 
Now to company news, one of the major players in the cocoa value chain industry in Nigeria, John Vent Industries Limited, has empowered cocoa farmers with one million cocoa seeds. Speaking at the grand opening of the empowerment program in Akure, the Ondo State Capital, the group managing director of the company, Mr. John Alamu, says the event is aimed at rehabilitation, regeneration and replanting cocoa trees over the next 10 years. Farmers and other stakeholders in the cocoa value chain converge in Akure, the Ondo State Capital, for the grand opening ceremony of John Vent's Cocoa Sustenance and Farmer Empowerment Program. The managing director of John Vent's Industries Limited, John Alamu, reveals the impact areas the empowerment will be anchored on. This project aims to empower 150,000 farmers covering about 300,000 hectares of farmland in rehabilitation, regeneration, and replanting of cocoa, cocoa trees over the next five to 10 years. Governor Rotimi Akiridulu, who was represented at the event by Senior Special Assistant on Agri and Agribusiness, asked John Vent Nigeria Limited to address the challenges in the provision of quality cocoa of international standards in Nigeria. John Vent has set a target of a million cocoa ceilings to be injected into uh, the cocoa value chain in the state. This is highly commendable. Other stakeholders here share their thoughts on the way forward uh, for cocoa production prepared. in Nigeria. When you are talking of sustainable cocoa production, we are talking of quality planting material, quality sites, and best management practices to get the best out of the limited land. Let our farmers know that by 2025, no cocoa. By advising our farmers, all these mean and much that you are adding into your cocoa, we have to stop it. The right chemical must be applied. The empowerment package, including agrochemical fungicides, insecticides, and herbicides for one hectare of farmland as well as the cocoa seeds per farmer were officially presented to the representatives of some of the cocoa products marketing unions from Owo, Idori, Oda in Ondo State, as well as others from Ilaoregu and Ileife in Ocean State. Please give a round of applause. Alano Odo is here with the latest business stories on the News at 10. Thank you, Kayode. Hello and welcome to Business News. African countries need $424 billion this year to help them recover from the devastation caused by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's according to the president of the African Development Bank, Dr. Akiwumi Adeshino. In a statement made... On Thursday, that's today, the AFDB chief explained that after decades of progress in the, on the continent in the fight against poverty, COVID-19 plunged 30 million Africans into extreme poverty in 2020. He also adds that the Russian war has fueled inflation and left millions hungry, while surging prices along with slowing economic growth are all increasing indebtedness in the region. Dr. Adeshino, however, recommended the need to expand the fiscal space for African countries while tackling the issue of debt. The Bureau of Public Enterprises, BPE, has announced the pre-qualification of 16 firms for the privatization of five national integrated power projects in Nigeria. Mr. Alex Oko made this announcement at the Investor Pre-Bid Conference for the privatization of five NIPP plants, Gregu, Omoto Show, Oloro Shogo, Calabar and Bening. Listed among the 16 pre-qualified bidders, uh, Montenegro, Nigeria, Amperian Power, Cyflex Energy, Pacific Energy Company Limited and Globelec Africa Limited. 
The Federal Airports Authority of Nigeria, FAN, has started arrangements to complete the installation of CAT's three airfield ground lighting system on runway 18L. 36R, and this is part of efforts to improve the safety and efficiency of flight operations at the Motala Mohammed Airport in Lagos. A statement from the airport's authority says the project, which will commence on Friday, July the 8th, will last for 90 days. However, FAN has explained that there will be no disruption to all four. There will be no disruption to all former and normal flight operations, as it will be conducted through runway 18R 36L. The Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission says that it will sanction any operator that fails to comply with the extant rules and regulations of the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission, NERC. According to the FCPC, the move is to punish offenders and it has become imperative due to the growing complaints by consumers over estimated billings, poor metering, wrong connections and illegal disconnection, among other issues. The commission also adds that it had been working with NERC to work on some policies and regulations to help reduce challenges faced by consumers in the electricity industry. South Africans who rely on taxes, that's public transport, to commute face a possible fare hike of between 25 and 30 percent because of high record of petrol prices. The proposed hike is coming courtesy of the National Taxi Alliance, which says that it has done what it can to save and avoid increase as fuel prices continue to rise this year. But with prices now at record highs, a hike in fee is imminent. As from July the 6th, motorists are now paying 2 rand 47 cents more per litre for petrol to take the price to an all-time high of 26 rand and 74 cents per litre. We head to the market now where after three days of negative sentiments, the color is green today, meaning a flat positive outcome. Investors' interest in Access Core supported market performance while volume of shares transaction rose over 5%. Laddie Williams has one. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Reports. Well, the NGX managed to eke out a green close today amid sell-offs and buy interest as the benchmark all share index added just one basis point. Not a big move uh, by the bulls today, but we'll take that. The activity chart is all uh, green with 142 million units of stocks traded in 3,816 deals valued at 1.73 uh, billion naira. Well, three of the fugas were in the green today, talking about GTCO, Access Score, and uh, Zenith Bank. I guess we can call them the gas. They also uh, traded in the green. And a couple of other tier two lenders helping prop up the banking counter up half a percent. While uh, Honeywell Flower and FTA and Cocoa processors also added uh, to the green we see in the consumer goods uh, counter. Well, Academy Press led the gainers uh, counter again today, adding 15 copper to its share price up 9.55%. Indicators showing strong buying pressure with that stock. Meanwhile, RT Briscoe led the losers counter uh, down 8.11%. Well, I guess we can call it a green close, but the week is looking quite bearish uh, with the looks of things. Uh, final trading day of the week tomorrow, fingers crossed. And that's the Stock Market Report. I'm Ladi Williams. It's back to you. And that's business news for tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Wawadu. The rest of the news at 10 continues now with Coyote. Banking, so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Well, thank you, Anne. Boris Johnson today resigned as prime minister, but says he will stay until the Conservative Party has elected a new leader. A timetable for succession is said to be announced by the 1922 Committee of Backbench MPs next week. Osama PC has more in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. The UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has quit as the Conservative leader but says he will continue to serve as PM until the party chooses his successor. Good afternoon everybody. Boris Johnson said it is clearly now the will of Conservative MPs that there should be a new leader. 
It came after a record number of resignations in 24 hours. More than 40 ministers and aides, including the Chancellor Rishi Sunak, quit on Wednesday over Johnson's handling of allegations of abusive behaviour by a Conservative MP. In his speech, he thanked his wife, Carrie, his children, the NHS, armed forces and Downing Street staff and said he was sad to be leaving the best job in the world. It is clearly now the will of the Parliamentary Conservative Party that there should be a new leader of that party and therefore a new Prime Minister. I know that there will be many people who are relieved and uh, perhaps quite a few who will also be disappointed. And I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. But Labour Party leader Sir Keir Starmer is demanding Boris Johnson stand down as Prime Minister immediately, saying it's not fair on the country for him to stay on as a caretaker Prime Minister. The dying act of his political career is to parrot that nonsense. Insisting Labour will take matters into its own hands if necessary, Starmer warns the Tories that if they don't get rid of Johnson, Labour will, in the national interest, bring a no-confidence vote, because, in his words, this can't go on. He needs to go completely. None of this nonsense about clinging on for a few months. He's inflicted lies, fraud and chaos in the country. And, you know, we're stuck with a, function, with a government which isn't functioning in the middle of a cost of living crisis. Meanwhile, Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, agreed that Boris Johnson should not be allowed to stay on after tending his resignation. Sturgeon said a general election would be in the country's best interest, but did not foresee Johnson's ruling Conservative Party calling an early vote. I think first and foremost there will be an overwhelming and very widespread sense of relief today that Boris Johnson's time as Prime Minister, which should probably never have been allowed to happen in the first place, is coming to an end. I do think it is quite incredible though to suggest that he will remain as Prime Minister for another three to four months. I think the sooner he is out of number 10, and preferably that is today, uh, the better. In other news, Ukraine says it is investigating more than 21,000 war crimes and crimes of aggression allegedly committed by Russia since the start of its invasion. The prosecutor general said she was receiving reports of between 200 to 300 war crimes a day. She admitted that many trials would be held in absentia, but stressed that it was a question of justice to continue with the prosecutions. Ukraine says it has uncovered multiple mass graves in Bukha, Borodyanka and other towns near the capital Kyiv that were briefly seized by Russian troops. Sri Lanka's president says he has asked Russia's Vladimir Putin to help his cash-strapped nation import fuel as it faces its worst economic crisis since independence from Britain in 1948. Gotabaya Rajapaksa said he had a very productive discussion with Mr Putin. It comes a day after hundreds of people took to the streets of the capital, Colombo, to protest against the government. The protests have been led by young people and supported by opposition political parties, trade union and civil society activists and ordinary civilians. Clashes have broken out in eastern Congo between military and M23 rebels. It comes just a day after Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda agreed to de-escalate tensions from a rebel insurgency. Diplomatic tensions have risen sharply between the neighbours since the M23 rebel group began a major offensive in Congo's eastern borderlands at the end of March. Congo has accused Rwanda of backing the group, something Kigali denies. And finally, Pamplona in Spain has seen its first famous bull run after a two-year hiatus due to Covid restrictions. Hundreds of runners were chased through the narrow city centre streets by steers and specially bred fighting bulls to Pamplona's bull ring, where the 800 metre course ends. Three runners were taken to hospital due to injuries caused by falls, but nobody was gored. At least 16 runners have lost their lives at the event since records began. This year's run lasted 2 minutes and 35 seconds. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Many thanks, Simon. The Union African champions, the Super Falcons of Nigeria, this evening recorded their first victory at the Women's African Nations Cup in Morocco. The defending champions beat Botswana 2-0 with goals from Ifioma Onomano and Christy Uchebe in the 21st minute and 48th minute. Andreas Christensen says he was a Barcelona supporter as a child and that signing with the Spanish Giants is a dream come true. 
Christensen has been officially presented as Barcelona's latest signing after leaving Chelsea FC at the end of his contract in June. And that's sports news. I'm Ayo Tunde. Thank you, Ayatunde. And finally tonight, motorists and commuters travelling in and out of Lagos via the Lagos Ibadan Expressway have been trapped in gridlock for hours. It is unclear what the reason for the traffic is, but travellers using that access may have to consider alternative routes or avoid the traffic altogether. And the main news again. Former Deputy Senate President Ike Kuramadu and his wife Beatrice today were remanded in custody till August the 4th as UK Magistrate Court accepted evidence that the kidney donor in their case is 21 years old. And that's the news at 10. Thank you for watching. I'm Kairo Kikili. Good night.